Good evening, I'm Christiane Amanpour and welcome to our program. It is one of the worst humanitarian tragedies of our time, the civil war in Congo, which has killed five million people. And the fighting continues with the most terrible consequences reserved for the women. The UN counted 16,000 cases of rape and sexual violence in the Congo last year alone. And the worst offender is the Congolese army. So tonight, we go behind the statistics with film shot in Congo by one of our producers, George Lerner. It documents the 10-year investigation by one human rights activist. Annika von Woudenberg, a researcher with Human Rights Watch, is on a mission to document abuses against the people of Eastern Congo. This area, the Itari district, saw ferocious fighting between the army and a rebel militia. Courage! <laughs> At the time of this journey, a ceasefire had just taken effect. We're already starting to see the burned out villages. Along the road, evidence of the scorched earth campaign that the Congolese army mounted to crush the insurgency. It's an operation that critics say seemed intent on punishing the people here for their alleged support of the rebels. <laughs> Kagaba had once been a village of 12,000. When Annika reached there, it was a refugee camp of half that number. C'est ça, c'est ça le résultat, de la guerre. Toutes nos maisons sont incendiées. Toutes les nous n'avons nous n'avons rien, absolument rien. The Congolese government either could not or would not maintain discipline over its troops here. People here say that soldiers roamed freely through the camp, abusing the population. In the first six months since the camp was established, more than 100 women, including these women with Annika, reported being raped by government troops. Yeah, beaucoup de problèmes. Uh, Cas de viol de, de nos enfants filles, cas de viol de, de nos mamans, cas de viol de nos femmes. C'est là, c'est fait ici. The soldiers of the Congolese Army 6 Brigade did not want to be filmed. Okay. But one did respond to the rape charges and talked about their mission. Puisque nous sommes venus ici. Avec prendre, combattre et récupérer le terrain. Avec la population, nous sommes avec eux ensemble sans problème. Il n'y a pas de problème de la violation. Nous sommes calmes. Vous pouvez me demander aux chefs qui sont ici. Nous, nous faisons toujours notre mission garder la population à l'air bien. Their methods of guarding the population, villagers here say, made rape a tool of war. I've never seen quite such deliberate or such intermixing between displaced people, between the civilians and the military. And I can see how dangerous this must be for, um, for the local people here. We know that the rapes are incredibly high in number here. Annika said this was allowed to happen, ironically, as a result of efforts to try to bring peace to Congo, because the government offered amnesty to militia leaders and encourage them to lay down their weapons and join the Congolese army. But for the people, that was an effort that backfired. They're integrated into the Congolese army. They become generals, they become colonels, and we then see that the Congolese army becomes an army of bandits, an army of war criminals, because they keep integrating individuals who are incredibly abusive into senior officer ranks. And joining me right now is Annika van Woudenberg, who has just returned from her latest trip to the Congo. Thank you so much for joining us. It is so shocking. You've just come back. That film was taken a couple of years ago. Has anything gotten any better? If anything, actually, it's gotten worse. I just came back indeed. And in eastern Congo, the rape statistics have been doubling or tripling. So despite the fact that there's now huge awareness about the issue as of rape as a weapon of war, we're not seeing it end and actually we're seeing it increase. It's increasing even though the president of, of Congo, Joseph Kabila, has said that there's going to be zero tolerance of this. Has, has any effort been made 
to stop this amongst the army? Well, zero tolerance is a very recent initiative. We met with President Kabila in July and spoke to him in detail about the cases of rape, especially those, of course, committed by his army. And he did take action. He announced this policy of zero tolerance. It's a good and noble objective. Of course, it has to be put into place. And, and so far, we're seeing some steps being taken, but there is a long way to go. So how do you account for the increase in the rapes and the killings and the burnings of the houses? Well, the rapes have increased since January of this year. So military operations started in January of this year, again in Eastern Congo. To do what? What specific military operations? Well, these are operations that are intended to deal with one of the rebel groups that has been plaguing Eastern Congo for 14 or 15 years. So an attempt to disarm and, and annihilate them That's has right. made, in fact, the situation worse for the civilians. That's right. And although this rebel group itself had carried out many rapes, the fact that the Congolese army is now carrying out these military operations is making the situation worse for women and girls. I'm just going to read you this and tell me uh, whether this is something that you agree with. The Congo Advocacy Coalition has said that because of disarming these Hutu rebels, which is a top priority, priority. Indeed, for every rebel who has been disarmed this year, one civilian has been killed, seven women or girls raped, and 900,000 people made homeless. So is this so-called peacekeeping effort worth the violence? That's exactly the question that needs to be asked. Human Rights Watch is part of this coalition, and we put this information out just yesterday saying, is this the cost that, w that should be paid? Is it right to ask again the women and girls of Eastern Congo to lay down their lives for a military operation that may or may not succeed? But why are they being raped? Rape is being used as a weapon of war in Eastern Congo. So we notice and, and we have documented that when armed groups rock into town, they will rape the women and girls, sometimes publicly, sometimes privately, in order to punish the local population. It's the easiest way to terrorize a community. Because there are also, you know, there, there, there is also the, the idea that these soldiers are saying, well, we're out here in the in the, in the hinterlands, 10 years away from our families. Let me read you a comment from one of the soldiers made to the Washington Post newspaper. What is making soldiers to do these bad things is their treatment by the army. Imagine one can of sardines for three soldiers in 15 days. You send a soldier away for 10 years, so I'm hungry, I'm in need of a wife, and I have no money to pay for a prostitute. It's crazy. I mean, it's, there's certainly one part of the problem is that the Congolese army is rarely paid and they don't get enough rations when they're out on military operations. So this, of course, makes the situation worse. It doesn't mean that they have to go out and rape, yet that is what they're doing. Is there any way from your investigations, from what you've seen on the ground, that you can see a way to ending this, not just the, the, the war, but the specific attacks against the women. Absolutely. I think they've got to start holding to account the generals and the colonels who are either themselves responsible or who allow their troops to rape. And so far, those are the guys that have been untouchable. No general has yet been held to account in Congo for rape, and it's high time that that changes. Because there is a tool in the international courts of justice. Out of the Bosnian war came the notion that rape is a tool of war, is a crime against humanity. Absolutely. Do and the Congolese, does the Congolese government, have they been made aware of this? Well, they have, in fact, done one very important case where they did try in the highest ranking individual, which was a major at that time, mm -hmm. for rape as a crime against humanity. But two weeks after he was found guilty, he escaped from prison, he and the rest of his individuals who had committed the rape. So there was a limited success to this story. We're at the moment waiting for one of the top generals to be held to account. The UN Security Council handed over a list to President Joseph Kabila of Congo in May with five names on it saying these are individuals in your army responsible for rape. Take action. And what leverage does the UN or the international community have, if at all? I think they have significant leverage. The largest UN peacekeeping mission in the world is in Congo. They pay some six million dollars in fuel and rations for the Congolese army. Now that should not be a blank check. That's got to come with a degree of conditionality. The UN should not be backing this army if this is an army that rapes more women and girls. And that's what they're doing. And haven't some of the UN 
peacekeepers also been implicated in the rapes? They have, of which is, I'm afraid, a sad reality of what has happened. But the percentage of peacekeepers involved in rape is a very small percentage of the total. Mm -hmm. The reality is that the peacekeepers are supposed to be there and I think are working to protect civilians, but more needs to be done. And I think in particular, peacekeepers have to say, we cannot support a Congolese army whose generals and colonels are rapists and killers, and there should be some conditions attached to the support they give. Given that this is so much of a civilian environment and the war is against civilians as much as against militias uh, and between militias, how does one protect the civilians? Well, I think there needs to be, of course, more peacekeepers. We always say this. We need more of them. But I think they have to be in the right locations and, of course, be asking questions of women. We know that women are raped often at roadblocks. We know that they're raped when they go to the marketplace. So the UN needs to ensure that they're adequately patrolling during market days, that they're removing roadblocks. You know, one of the other sad realities is the majority of those who are raped are adolescent girls, 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds. Their lives are often ruined by this. And I think we've got to take more seriously the protection of civilians is not just protecting them from death, it's protecting them from rape. And it's been going on for 13 years. We'll continue this right after a break, so stay with us. But next, what can UN peacekeepers in Congo do to stop these rapes, especially when some of them, as we've said, are accused of engaging in the very same violence? A former head of UN peacekeeping will join us in a moment. It's shameful to see anybody in uniform doing anything and that is contrary to the reasons why he's in fact in uniform. So, yes, it's shameful. That was President Joseph Kabila of the Congo speaking three years ago. He called it shameful then, and this summer he's uh, announced a policy of zero tolerance. But what can really be done about these terrible crimes? We'll discuss that in a moment, but first, we want to look at some of the developing news in the Congo right now, violence in the northeastern part of that area, and I'm joined on the phone by Kenneth Lavelle of Médecins Sans Frontières in Bounia. How is it going there right now? What's happening with the civilians? And it's not just now, it's been ongoing for nearly one year now. Uh, another forgotten conflict with hundreds of thousands of the civilian population displaced, uh, thousands killed, and it's ongoing today. And uh, there's a huge need for an increase in humanitarian assistance to, to these uh, neglected, forgotten people in the northeast of Congo. What's happening to the civilians in the northeast? Well, I mean, since... Uh, the, the LRA attacks at the end of last year and the joint operation from the Ugandan and Congolese government, hundreds of thousands of people have been forced from their homes uh, into the big urban centres in the, the northeast of Congo, unable to get back home, relying on humanitarian assistance and uh, uh, the assistance from their, their Congolese neighbours. And uh, yeah, they're completely locked. They're completely terrified, and they can't get back home. The violence is ongoing, and uh, yeah, it's a catastrophe for the people there. All right, thank you so much for, join for joining us there from Bounia, and we're going to take up this discussion now with our guests in the studio. I'm joined by Jean-Marie Goheno, a former head of UN peacekeeping operations, and again by Annika von Wutenberg, senior researcher at Human Rights Watch. Thank you very much indeed. So that particular outbreak from Ugandan uh, Lord's Resistance Army, that rebel group coming in, from the, from the west you've got the Rwandan-backed Hutu rebels, can anything be done about this, Jean-Marie? Well, what, we, what needs to be done is to have a state in Congo that can control its territory and that has the confidence of the people. The violence in the Kivus, the violence in Ituri, it is the result of a vacuum, the fact that there is no administration, there is no credible state, there is no justice. And so that vacuum is being occupied by various militias and unfortunately, when the Congolese army integrates a militia without sorting between the killers and those who could be integrated, it just adds to the problem. Let me read what some human rights uh, officials are saying, including Oxfam. This appalling violence is no accident. It is the result of the UN-backed Congolese military operation against the FDLR militia, the Rwandan. It's a strategy that is being supported in capitals and in the highest echelons of the United Nations. Well, I think the UN is in a tough spot there, to be frank, because if it did not give any support 
to the Congolese army, probably the Congolese army might prey even more on the population. At the same time, the notion that you are going to get rid of those militias just through military operations without building credible institutions is an institution. In the Kivus, there are 10 million people. There's a lot of discussion on Afghanistan today. Uh, they look at the ratio of what would be needed to protect the population. If one applied the counterinsurgency ratios when that the U.S. Army uh, thinks of, let's say, 20 uh, per thousand, that would mean, that would mean 200,000 troops in Congo, 200,000 accountable troops. You when don't have them? Of course so, not. So, Annika, I mean, is it all or nothing? No, I mean, I think the military operations require more conditionality by the UN, right? As we have been talking about, they should say to the Congolese army, yes, we'll come and support you, but only if you remove the killers and the rapists from your you ranks. You mentioned a list of five. That's right. So the UN Security Council did hand over a list of five to President Joseph Kabila of generals responsible for rape, and we're still waiting for action on that. The top individual, one of the main generals, who we know has carried out widespread sexual violence, his name is General Jérôme Kakou, He's still allowed to sit in his home, watching TV, not been arrested. You know, if the president is serious about zero tolerance, if the UN is serious about protecting women and girls from rape, they should be demanding the immediate arrest of individuals like this. Why doesn't the UN demand? Why doesn't the US demand? Is paying a quarter of the peacekeeping uh, costs? Why, why don't you demand these things? Well, I mean, I think the UN is uh, demanding it, but I, I totally agree with uh, Annika van Wundenberg that there has to be a more clear message from the international community. There's not going to be peace on the cheap in Congo. If one wants peace, one has to be serious about building a state that is not just one militia replacing another. And the shortcut were to push out the, uh, the Hutu militias, which has committed abominable crimes. You just bring in another militia. That is not going to end the cycle of violence. Did the UN ever hold accountable its own troops who were implicated in the rape? It did. It's a command issue. You have to start with the commanders of the battalions. If you go one soldier at a time, it doesn't work. So did they? The only way, yes. There were commanders who were sanctioned. There were actually, in, some, in one particular instance, there was a whole unit uh, which were of police which was uh, repatriated. Mm -hmm. So that has happened. But it's an ongoing fight. I think the UN needs to continue to hold accountable the commanders, because it's a command issue. If you, if you think you can do it one soldier at a time, you will not achieve results. Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of the root of this conflict, a lot of it is about natural resources, minerals. Is the international community doing enough to make sure that those minerals are not such such a valuable uh, prospect for these militias. No, in fact, I think the international community has largely failed on that front. There's no doubt that Congo's immense mineral wealth is part of the problem. It's not the only problem, but it's part of the problem. And the UN Security Council demanded a panel of experts year after year to report on this. When they finally reported, I think they sent out about six or seven different reports, mm -hmm. the UN Security Council refused to take adequate action on companies in their own jurisdiction mm -hmm. who were responsible for some of these atrocities or who helped facilitate the atrocities. And in terms of, as these atrocities are going on, it's always the civilians who are the, who are the principal victims, principally the women and children. Civilian protection, how is that going to happen when you say there's so few, uh, relatively, and the latest batch, and only just arriving, the latest batch mm -hmm. of some 3,000 peacekeepers? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not going to happen only through military means. Military means can help, and the international community could have done more to support the United Nations mm -hmm. with more intelligence, more special forces to have targeted operations. But the real response is first to make a more serious effort at creating a serious Congolese army and a serious police. And frankly, there, the efforts of the international community have been disjointed and ineffective in the last few years. What and should they be doing? Well, they should be very clear with the government of Congo on developing a real plan, which again starts at the top. You need a ministry of defense that is effective. Mm -hmm. You need a command chain that is credible. You need the money to go to pay the soldiers, not to disappear in between. Some efforts have been made, but clearly insufficient. Do, you, do you believe that you have a credible partner in President Joseph Kabila, who has said the right things in public? Is that something to be built on? 
Look, you know, a, co a country is never just its leader. It is also its institutions. It's it's trying to do de the democracy that ought to be developed in Congo. I think we certainly have some huge concerns about the direction that President Kabila is taking the government in Congo. It is becoming increasingly repressive as opposed to open. The reality is this is a state that has to be rebuilt after years of war. But I think far too often the international mm -hmm. community is too quick to blame the UN without in international capitals backing up UN peacekeepers. And the United States is critical to this. Yeah, and we've seen this year after year in many, many places in terms of, of not enough peacekeepers and not enough funding and resources. Mm -hmm. But what you mentioned the Rwandan uh, militias, the Rwandan uh, militias who are operating there. Do you believe the... Uh, the government has a responsibility, the government of Rwanda? I think what you see now, no, the, the Rwandan militias, I mean, in Congo, they were, they were a former genocidaire. Mm -hmm. uh, they are the ones that the Rwandan government rightly wants to I mean, see uh, disappear. Mm -hmm. The issue there is that you're not, you don't want to replace another a militia by another militia. Mm -hmm. uh, that will just further inflame the violence in Congo. What is needed is exactly what uh, Annika van Vundenberg said. You need institutions. You need the people in the Kivus no. to manage their considerable differences and conflicts over land, over all sorts of issues, uh, through political institutions. And there, there, are, in, there is a timetable. Next year, there's supposed to be local elections in Congo. Will these local elections be credible? Will there be a real opportunity for the people to express themselves, mm -hmm. or will they be just a sham? That's, that's a very important uh, issue. Mm -hmm. And as you look to these elections, whatever they might turn out, tell me what your worst fear or hope is for the actual people on the ground, the women, the children, the old men who are caught up in this. My worst fear is that we're going to continue to see those individuals responsible for rape being mm -hmm. promoted. Mm -hmm. My hope is that the women and girls of, Co of Eastern Congo in particular will continue to speak mm -hmm. out. I think we've seen immense courage from those women and girls to say, no, we've had enough. Mm -hmm. 200,000 of them have been raped. I just received an email from a doctor in northeastern Congo this morning talking again about a young girl mm -hmm. who'd been a virgin who was raped. Mm -hmm. You know, this is destroying them. Let's, let's not forget forget what's happening to these women and girls. And on that note, Annika, thank you very much. Mr. Guhena, thank you very much indeed. And now